big welcome and thank you to um, our friends at FINSA um, who have been incredibly generous in sponsoring <coughs> the event today. So thank you so much for making this day possible for us. Uh, I'd also like to mention that MOA and FINSA were also finalists in the Katie's Philanthropy the Lent reprise last year. So I'm really proud of that and I look forward to our continued work together. So without further ado, we can get the conference started. And our first moderator today is Ellie Strathaki and she's the architecture editor at Wallpaper Magazine and she'll be introducing the rest of the speakers on the panel for the first panel. So thank you so much, Ellie. Thanks, Alisa. Um, um, thank you. Thank you so much to Melissa Melody and Museum of Architecture for um, having us here. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, the notion of collaboration. Um, obviously very broad, but we have a suitably very varied panel of speakers and hopefully they will help um, sort of um, shed some light into sort of what makes a perfect collaboration and what is needed in order to sort of use it in a sort of efficient way in moving forward. Um, sadly, um, Marina couldn't make it, um, as Melissa said. Um, our plans are not collaborating. <laughs> <laughs> but we have with us um, engineer Jane Wernick, uh, who founded Jane Wernick Associates in 1998, uh, which is incorporated into engineers HRW. So I'm sure most of you will know Jane. She's an established um, professional, an established figure in her field, um, working on projects such as the treetops um, walkway at Kew Gardens and the um, a range of living architecture houses. Um, we also have uh, Haifa Matar, um, who is a diplomat and has served as a deputy permanent representative of the Kingdom of Bahrain and the United Nations. Um, she has training in politics of the world economy, so I'm sure she will bring a unique perspective to today's discussion. Um, and finally, last but not least, we have uh, Rona Mayuha's Lob Goblins of uh, Kuka Studio. Uh, Rona is an industrial designer, she's uh, an art director, and she's a researcher. She's worked on um, many different fields, lighting, installations, product design, um, and her pieces are sold in over 100 retails. Um, retailers around the world. Um, I think that's probably enough for me for now. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a presentation from each one, and then we're going to start on our conversation. Um, so I think I'm calling in first, Jane. <laughs> while I introduce what I'm going to talk about. Um, so thank you um, very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, and as mentioned, I'm, I am a structural engineer, so I'm talking about um, my perspective on collaborations really through my career. And I'm very pleased that one of my longest um, collaborators, Julia Barfield, is here as well. Um, so. I want to speak about how I have perceived the advantages of collaboration and how it's influenced my career. I was fortunate to have met the late engineer Peter Rice in 1977 when I joined a group that was working on some Fry Auto structures uh, for Kokomas, which is a project for the Saudi government that didn't actually get built. Peter had recently finished working with Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers on the Centre Pompidou and he continued to work with and collaborate with both of those architects for the rest of his life. One of the projects that he brought to our group was this study for Fiat. The idea was that we could replace the monocoque structure of the car with the return to the chassis that could be made of steel pressings one millimetre thick. So this is um, one of the drawings of the, of the pressings that would be joined together with rivets. And this is a sketch that I did of, of how, how it might be put together. Um, we could represent the structure um, with a simple beam element in a computer analysis model um, that just took minutes to run. And in those days, to carry out a full analysis of a monocoque structure 
would have taken days and weeks of a huge mainframe computer, possibly half the size of this room. So this would be um, cheaper to analyze. And also you could, you could cloud the structure with plastic panels that would be replaceable. And you could concentrate all your corrosion protection into a smaller number of elements. Um, we aim to give um, this, this car structure the same stiffness as the Ritmo car. Oops, no, how do I, sorry, yeah, here we are. So this, this, this graph shows the, the, the length of the car between the, the wheels, and then this is showing how, how torsionally stiff the structure is. And this is important when you think about a car maybe with one, one wheel on the curb. So, so we had to make sure that, that, we, that we were kind of on, on this line for, for our stiffness. <coughs> and they actually made um, a full-scale um, uh, prototype of the structure. And, and probably this is the only time in my life that one of the structures I've analyzed has had a load case applied to it that was the same as the load case that we <coughs> thought about when we were designing it. So when we design a building, you know, we, we might think about this building having full maximum capacity of live load on every single floor or every other floor or half the building. And probably during the life of the building, it's not going to see any of those particular combinations of load cases. And even if it did, we don't go back and actually measure the internal stresses and the deflections. So this was quite good because they did actually measure did its torsional stiffness after we'd made this prototype. Um, I learned a great deal um, by seeing how Peter collaborated with the architects he worked with. He was prepared to talk about almost any aspect of design. He was also very open about the structural solutions that he considered. He was prepared to try ideas out and accepted that they might not always lead to the final solution. But he showed how the investigative process nearly always enriched the design. So I want to describe some of the design collaborations that I've experienced. I was very lucky to meet David Marks and Julia Barfield in the mid-80s when Julia was at Foster's working on the BBC Radio Headquarters project that was to have been built on the Langham site. And I was still at Arabs. Oops. Um, David was at Rogers working on Lloyd's and they asked me to collaborate with them and Marcus Lee on the Grand Buildings competition at Trafalgar Square. We'd meet up at their house on a Saturday morning and I'd stop off en route to buy co croissants while they brewed the coffee. For me, it was the first time that I'd collaborated on my own with architects, and it proved to be the start of a long-term conversation. We didn't win that competition, but a couple of years later, when I was in Los Angeles running at Arab's office, they faxed me sorry, to ask if I would um, collaborate with them on an ideas competition for a bridge of the future. We modeled it on Darcy Thompson's idea of the animal as a quadrupedal bridge where the, the, your bones take the compression and your tendons kind of modulate your, your movements. Um, and it was, so, so you're, the animal is spanning between the front and the back legs. Um, I like the idea of those primitive rope bridges that actually move as you walk across them. So our structure was fixed on one side of the Grand Canyon and on the other side was just supported vertically so it would move about a bit as you walked across it. When I returned to London, we worked on this water sports activity centre in the Princess Stock in Liverpool. The lower level is the wet level, where the columns are set back from the edge. Hmm? Yeah. And then the, the columns branch out to support a wider first floor structure, which is the dry level. Um, and uh, we had a very tight budget, so we decided to spend some money, though, on, on the two castings, which are at either end of the branches, so this big casting here and the little one there, um, which they somehow echo the feel of the heavy ironwork that you see around the Victorian docks. You may have heard that in 1972, the King of Bhutan said that we should measure the happiness of a society as much, or, or the success of a society rather, as much by measuring the gross national happiness, the GNA population, <coughs> as by measuring the gross domestic domestic product, or GDP. And the Swiss economists, Bruno Frey and Alois Stutzer, have been writing about what economists could learn from happiness research since the 1990s. I was a member of the then think tank at the RIBA called Building Futures, and we looked at what might be happening in the built environment in 20 to 50 years' time. So I proposed the topic of building happiness, that is, 
How does or can the way in which we design our built environment affect our psyche? This book's a collection of essays by practitioners and researchers in the built environment, as well as some short pieces by well-known people about places that really give them del delight. I think it shows that there are many ways of thinking about what the effects of what we construct can be on our ability or likelihood to feel happy or sad. At the same time, a number of consistent threads emerge. People are happier if they feel engaged with how their local community is run. In the, the way we design their, spa their physical space encourages this, and so much the better. And how we feel about a place is affected by many things. As the landscape architect Martha Schwartz says, <clears throat> although a visit to the Grand Canyon is thrilling, her childhood memories mean that her backyard rates higher as a happy place. There are benefits to being generous in the design of spaces that allow for social interactions. Students suffer if their rooms open onto long corridors with no windows. It matters if strangers can walk past your bedroom window. And of course, the physical conditions of daylight and warmth and noise all play a part. <clears throat> I think that many of the breast projects arise also when all members of the team respect and trust each other. This is an essential component for collaboration. Now, David and Julia seem to have had a knack for finding some great clients and consultants, sometimes even stepping up to be clients themselves. And you could say that this next project is all about bringing delight. They asked me to collaborate with them on another ideas competition. This is for a landmark for the new millennium. And David had the idea to build the world's largest observation wheel, and Julia spotted the site beside County Hall. Because Jubilee Walk is protected and we didn't want to put a leg in the water, we decided to cantilever the structure so that the wheel could hang over the river. They wanted a wheel that was of the future, and probably ideally would have no elements connecting the hub to the rim. So we tried to just have one stiff arm going straight across. But that really made the rim very heavy. As you can see here, the rim has to span halfway around that big circle. So instead, we adapted the structure of the bicycle wheel. The bicycle wheel is a magical structure, I think. It's a tensegrity structure in that the compression elements, the rim and the hub, don't touch each other, apart from being connected by tension elements. But also, it's the horizontal spokes oops, that stop the wheel going into a, into a horizontal oval when the weight comes down onto it. And so, interestingly, th very, very thin horizontal elements are resisting the big vertical load. In the case of the Millennium Wheel, the load doesn't come from the spindle, it comes from the rim. And um, it's the pre-stress in the cables that stop that wheel going into a vertical sort of oval. I could actually talk about this structure for a couple of hours, but I'll spare you. <laughs> um, but the other key thing for us was that the, um, that the capsule should be outside the rim, not dangling within it, so that when you're at the top, you can see all around. This project really was about collaboration. So there were probably thousands of people who contributed to its design and construction, not to mention all the hours of negotiations with planners, lawyers, and funders. This is the wheel being lifted before the capsules were attached. And here is the capsule being brought down the river. The very transparent appearance of the wheel here, despite the cables, is what was one of the main objectives. And of course, the view at the top, where you can see out in all directions. <coughs> this was our office on one of our many flights. We were then invited to work with David and Julia on a new treetop walkway at Kew Gardens. Julia and I walked around the, ch the chosen area near the Temperate House with Tony Kirkham, their chief arboriculturist. We discussed what colour the steel should be. It's hard to find a colour that blends well with nature. So I suggested Corten and weathering steel, <coughs> which forms a layer of rust on the outside that protects the inside of the steel from rusting. But it also goes this kind of nice rusty colour, which would blend and patinate well with nature. <coughs> it was also great when it came to designing the pylons, because it meant we weren't forced for cost reasons to use circular hollow sections for, for, for the supports for the walkway. And by making them fabricated and triangular, firstly, we can make them tapered, but also, I always love the triangle as a, as a structural section because you see the, the sharp edge of the, of the corner and it makes somehow the element seem lighter. 
this is a mock-up of the node of the pylon splitting into the three branches. So we wanted a cut structure that wouldn't compete with the trees, and we quickly settled on using the balustrades to act as trusses that span between the pylons. One option was to have the, the diagonals at 100 millimeter centers so that they would also provide the safety barrier to stop people falling out. And we looked at many arrangements for the diagonals. The architects came up with a good suggestion of using quite a transparent mesh called Expermet, which meant that we could have our diagonals at wider spacings and, kind of, and many different arrangements could be considered. Actually, they, um, they also, architects this is, also really like the Fibonacci sequence, which occurs a lot in nature. So it's a sequence, it's one plus one is two, one plus two is three, two plus three is five, etc. And we use this to determine the spacing of the intersection of the diagonals with the main bottom chord and top chord. Of course, we could have joined all of those dots, but then we'd have many more diagonals than we needed. So I suggested that we wouldn't ever have more than three diagonals meeting at, at a node, and Julia and I sat down and we basically joined the dots to get an arrangement that looked suitably random and attractive, and then we could flip, so flip it so, oops, on, on, so that on one side of one half of the walkway, we've got that pattern, and then this pattern is exactly the same, just upside down. We used piles in the ground, that's these piles here, to, to anchor the structure. And of course, the wind can blow in any direction, so to make sure that we don't overload any of the piles, the minimum number you need is four. And they could be threaded through the main radi radial um, roots of the trees, but we still needed to connect the tops of them to the underside of, of, the, of the pylon. And to do that, we would normally use a concrete pile cap one meter thick and perhaps three to four meters square and that would have wiped out a huge amount of fibrous roots below ground so instead we designed the steel bridge which was only 450 millimeters deep and then all the fibrous roots can grow back afterwards and you can see that each arrangement of piles is going to be different depending on where the roots were so we did a radar survey of where the roots were We benefited by asking the client if we could have a steel fabricator brought on board before we finished our detailed design. And we were very lucky from having Tony Marriott, who was then with Brit Britain Steel, um, to join the team. So as well as informing how we designed the foundations, to David and Tony developed a great rapport, and which was essential so that um, Tony's tree surgeons were able to move branches out of the way when, when David's people were coming in, and they became close friends as a result of this. So here's the pylon being lifted. I think it almost looks best at this stage where you can see how it blends in so well with the trees. This is um, some of the key members of our design team on the opening day. This is the very transparent mesh, and this is um, kids on, on, on the walkway, which means the parents feel quite secure because they're not tempted to try and climb up over the, over the side. <laughs> and Tony Kirkham actually later planted some redwoods, which hopefully will grow up beside these trees and blend in well. In 1994, the Atlanta-based architects, um, Max Gogg and the Merrill Elon, asked me to work with them on this kiosk for Atlanta during the 96 Olympics. And I suggested the use of blue, blue lamb timber tip sticks up to 100 feet long, which by kneeling in different <coughs> directions and connecting to a bending stiff canopy could um, provide the, the stability that we needed without having to have cross braces, so none of those columns meet at a point. And a German engineer called Peter Bircher had dis developed a system which is a bit like the, the Mero system, where you have steel nodes to connect the elements together. And because they're, uh, they're, they're spheres, the nose can come in at any angle and it's easier to design the connection. This project didn't actually happen, but some years later, um, the architect Peter Beard asked me um, if I would collaborate with him on a walkway. So this goes from the top of the very ugly um, bridge over the high-speed one train at Raynham 
this, this railway severs the village of Raynham from the marshes, which are over here. And this is a long inclined walkway that goes down to the marshes. And I wanted to use that idea that we developed in Atlanta again. And um, so these, so what we have is a, 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 a stiff steel ladder, and then it's supported by timber columns, again, at different angles, but not meeting at a point. So it's the combination which provides the stability. There's cross beams that are every three meters. Occasionally we had to leave the, the, the columns underneath out because there would be a road going underneath and up, up here there was a, a waterway. We had to, and you can see that each column went from the point where it met the underside of the cross beam to one of four points at the ground so that each column was at 15 degrees to the vertical and could go at one of four points. And this, this is a deflected um, diagram under wind loads. Um, this, this plan just shows all the places where we couldn't put piles into the ground. So we've, uh, all the, it's just these areas where we were allowed to, because there were so many services and other obstructions, which made it a more complicated structure than it looked just from the superstructure. And then we had to worry about wobbly bridge syndrome. So this is a vibration study, and we found by check by changing systematically the point we chose for the foot of each column to be, we were able to come up with the stiffest um, arrangement, and we had, and, and that meant that we were there's a magical um, natural frequency that we have to be above, which is 1.3 hertz, which is the natural frequency that could be set off by people walking, and that's what caused the bobbing bridge. Um, I'm sorry, this is so faint, but this is the architect's cross section. That, and this is his study model of, of, of top of it. This is looking up the walkway. Um, this is it um, completed. So it kind of looks like it's dancing a bit. And I like the fact that the timber is as close as possible as being trees. So it's it just had the bark taken off. It is treated. And at top and bottom, we have those same virtue connections so we have these um, spherical nodes with universal joints to enable it, the joints to be at any angle. And that's the final one. So I just want to conclude by returning to the theme of happiness. Um, so when I was working on that project, Purim Desai, um, who was then with Bioregional Quintain, who were the developers for the Bedsed housing scheme that you may have heard of, told me that he believed that happiness was the key to sustainability. So at the start of each of their projects, they would get all the members of their teams, that's including clients, builders, stakeholders, etc., uh, together to write down their happiness plan for the project. I do believe that if we could put happiness and well-being at the heart of our endeavours, we would be more likely to produce a built environment that benefits not current users, but also future generations. Thank you. I just wanted to first and foremost thank um, Melissa and Melody for inviting me uh, to this panel. Um, I think it's really crucial that um, the design community and foreign policymakers come together more often um, at events like these um, because uh, we both, I think, discuss and have many conversations um, uh, more often than not. Um, that are parallel, but perhaps dis uh, disconnected conversations on crucial issues, on urbanization, um, climate change, uh, refugee integration, uh, security, terrorism, economic growth. Um, so there's huge scope for collaboration between our, both our, our two communities, um, and perhaps a separate event could be uh, dedicated uh, to that. Um, I'd like to focus primarily on collaboration in my field of work. I'm a diplomat. Um, I've been working in diplomacy for the last 13 years. Um, and I think collaboration lies at the very heart of, of, of diplomacy. Uh, when it comes to negotiations, which is a, a key component of, uh, of, our, of our role, um, collaboration is critical uh, to arrive at a mutually uh, beneficial agreement. Um, as diplomats, uh, we need to think carefully about uh, the design of these negotiations. Um, a lot of key protocol details have to be considered carefully. Um, things like location, who's invited, uh, seating charts, photo ops, um, all of these key elements that maybe not everyone thinks about uh, 
um, uh, are sometimes really critical uh, components um, that could pave the way for a success or failure um, of negotiations. Um, I think um, in uh, uh, over the last couple of years, um, and um, picking up from something that Jane mentioned, uh, one element of collaboration that I personally feel very strongly about uh, during my time at the UN was um, for founding and, and co-chairing a group of friends uh, of mental health and well-being. Um, this was in collaboration with uh, two other countries, uh, Canada and Belgium, and we started to work very closely um, to uh, advance uh, uh, mental health and well-being and have that conversation in the UN um, far, more, uh, far more regularly. We hosted uh, very large events on that, and this conversation continues to be uh, an important um, uh, part of uh, the, uh, the international debate. Um, but going back to um, sort of broader, uh, a broader context within our work, um, I think um, there have been some successes um, in collaboration in the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, the fight um, against Daesh, ISIS, um, was I think a success, uh, and um, it demonstrated the potential for action on issues where many states of the region and beyond um, have a shared interest, um, and and, uh, and there was progress made over there. Um, what I'd like to focus um, on uh, beyond kind of some of the more successful stories are um, some perhaps collaborations that may have not worked. Um, I think there's a lot that you could take away from that. Um, and collaborations that are still ongoing um, <coughs> as well, some that have kind of slowed down that need to be picked up again. Um, and um, so some of the more kind of obvious ones um, uh, and sort of some of the glaring kind of missed opportunities that we've had um, have been the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, one of the sort of longest uh, running conflicts in the modern era. Um, it's a cyclical <coughs> conflict um, rather than a linear one, which basically means that time doesn't necessarily always bring a solution. Um, and it's had a ripple effect uh, in feeding other conflicts in the region. Um, you know, there was a, an Arab peace initiative that I think was a missed opportunity there. Um, but you know, hopefully we'll be able to, to make some progress um, on that front. Another glaring uh, Missed opportunity, I believe, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, but very recently, has been um, the Syria uh, conflict, um, which began in 2011. Um, it's one of the most the bloodiest and most complex conflict uh, conflicts uh, of today. Um, I think there was since it since the since its inception, there was. Um, a real failure to de-escalate the conflict, and there was a real failure to create a region-wide crisis response mechanism uh, to cope with the influx of refugees. Um, on beyond conflicts um, and in other areas that we, um, as diplomats, continue uh, to work with, and um, other you know officials, government officials, and NGOs, and so forth, um, uh, work together on um, some perhaps are missed opportunities, others are ongoing collaborations that may have not made massive um, uh, massive uh, advances um, in, in our region, um, have been environmental <coughs> collaborations. Um, uh, in the Middle East, uh, temperatures rise twice as fast as the rest of uh, the world on average uh, due to the amplifying effect of, um, of desert conditions. Um, so climate change could be something that we should be working more um, <coughs> closely together across uh, various countries. Um, another obvious point would be natural resources. Um, water uh, would be a, a, you know, a major uh, uh, resource um, that really is, uh, uh, it will possibly be kind of the next wave of conflicts will be on will be contingent on, 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 on water and access to water. Um, innovation and policy development, um, unemployment, um, creating policy uh, regional labs that I think we could 
you know, bring in also the design community as well um, uh, to pursue evidence-based data and labor mobility um, in the region. Um, there have been, um, you know, monetary union, economic integration um, in the Gulf, um, uh, so, which has always been a vision since uh, since the inception. Um, we're making progress now on uh, the GCC rail link, um, so that will come into fruition over the next couple of years. And the one that fascinates me the most is space. Um, uh, I think uh, that area has been right for collaboration in the region for a very long time. And it's only been um, quite recently that about 11 Arab countries have been coming together to uh, create a program um, uh, and uh, to, to, further, uh, to further their uh, space collaboration. Um, so they're planning to launch a satellite in a couple of years and can really look at uh, even uh, drought and um, desertification and so forth. So they're um, you know, very excited about hearing about what will happen on that front. I think what we can learn from these opportunities of collaboration, some of them, that haven't made as much progress as others um, is um, is that uh, although they seem very obvious, if the political will is not there, if the climate's not right, if the timing is off, it could cause major setbacks. Um, collaborations in the diplomatic uh, realm are process, and so you have to be very patient um, with them, um, and sometimes you end up taking a couple of steps back before you <coughs> Uh, move ahead. Um, protocol can be very tricky, um, and personal diplomacy can actually go a long way. Um, there's never really an even exchange when it comes to negotiations, but I think everyone has to feel um, that they can have some wins. Um, I'm hopeful that we can make progress in, in these areas and make sure that productive collaborations are, are never missed again. Thank you. Rona, I'm a designer, and um, uh, like Ellie um, mentioned, and also many other things. Um, I will show you some of my projects. Obviously, as a designer, my, my um, main work and the essence of it is collaborations. Uh, I collaborate with architects, I collaborate with engineers, uh, with uh, uh, families, uh, people, uh, people at the end, really, and hopefully to make their life better. Um, I get my inspiration by exploring my um, uh, new materials and working technologies and that what helps me to shape my designs. So I'll start by presenting the first project. Um, this is a table I did um, during the Salon del Mobile in Milan uh, using reclaimed quartz surface. Uh, the material is sourced from the local factory not far from where I live in Caesarea, made uh, by an Israeli company, Caesarstone. The chiseled edge, as you can see, maybe I will, uh, it works. Never mind, but you can see the chiseled edge. Um, reminds mining methods of the quartz. Oops. Following this table, uh, Caesarstone approached me and asked me to design uh, their 42 square meter stand during LDF super brands by using the same concept of the table to expose their new 34 colors. The shape is repetitive, it's an algorithm, so we could produce it from 5 centimeters to 1.2 meters, and uh, we made about 400 of them. I don't know if you've been in, uh, if you've seen it, it was two years ago. Um, we started with a, a quartz engraved in the, um, in the, uh, sorry, inlaid in the parquet, and then it gradually uh, uh, started to grow and hang from the ceiling until it basically, um, um, the surround was in the space. So this is just a few details of it. Collaboration of this one, uh, we, we cut the stone in Israel, we, we inlaid it uh, in, in Bristol, um, um, we are a small office of, uh, we were then a small studio of three people, and uh, to get other people 
believing in what we do, we had to uh, we grow into 15 and working with uh, big companies like Caesarstone. Um, this mirror is another piece I did uh, based on an old design. Um, it's, this one is made specially for the Bankside Hotel in London uh, for the uh, 200 rooms. And um, they wanted uh, our uh, basic design and uh, we changed it uh, to meet their requirements such as obviously health and safety. This project uh, was made in collaboration with a Portuguese company, a Cork company named um, Amorim. It was commissioned by the British Consul in Israel and the Fresh Paint Art Fair. The brief was to design an interactive informal communal seating uh, which is uh, located, uh, as you can see, the yellow mark there. It's, it's uh, so it's uh, located in the exterior part patio of uh, a new built um, uh, natural history mu museum in Tel Aviv. So the whole idea was to create this place where uh, kids could run, play, eat, destroy, <laughs> do whatever they want. Uh, the raw material comes in big blocks, which I thought could be used without having to involve any machinery work. Um, and so uh, we used three types of raw cork material inspired by the topography of the area, which is the highest point in Tel Aviv, and also the, uh, the cork or oak bark. Lito um, is a modular light uh, is bespoke made but industrially made. We made about uh, 1,000 of them and we are now continuing a, a new batch. Um, it's it's uh, aluminum made from OLED panels and it's been made in collaboration with LG Lighting after winning their collaboration program which they run every year. Um, we've designed and developed it especially for Biohouse which is the developer. Um, so BioHouse is a company that creating co-working spaces for people coming from the biotechnology and biopharmaceutical sectors, and um, their spaces are always next to hospitals and laboratories, and um, and so I saw the potential in using it healthy and sustainable light. The module is like a simple thin box, and it has a universal connector at the back, so it creates basically different reads in the light and design scheme. Uh, in the photo here, um, uh, it's uh, the Israeli Negev Desert. I grew up in Israel, but my curiosity towards it started only when I moved back. Um, last year, uh, at the Salona del Mobile, um, I've designed a collection of contemporary tapestries uh, for a company, Italian company, iMesh. It's the first project these are contemporary tapestries, but in reality, these can be also uh, room dividers and uh, for indoors and outdoors. This company comes from a selling, uh, they're doing sales, so they have one machine and they have this knowledge and they came into the decor uh, um, sector. So uh, this is the first time I've been working on a 2D. Um, I was inspired as well here by topography and the desert and the mountains, and I wanted to give the, three, the 2D thread a depth, so from far it looks three-dimensional, although it's flat. Feluca is a small sailing boat. I'm running fast because I, don't, I know we don't have time, so I'm kind of sorry for that. <laughs> I also made notes, so it's easier. Um, it's a small sailing boat crossing the Nile. The sail volume is defined, obviously, by the wind, and so I made Feluca light shade, which is flat piece made of uh, fireproof uh, Nomex fabric held by two snap fasteners. And its volume is uh, defined by the bowl itself. This is one of the biggest, uh, sort of biggest, but most complicated project I've worked on. Um, I'm, I was happy to, he to hear Jane, uh, um, um, with your kind of very creative engineer, and in this case, I also was fortunate enough to work with a very creative engineer. Um, this is also the first project I did for public spaces in, in Israel. Um, these two luminaires are 11 meter tall. It's over three uh, floors tall. It's the biggest product I have ever done. Usually I'm working on a small scale and 
and this is also sustain, um, suspended from the ceiling in a public space. Um, it sits in a in a in the one of the main boulevard in Tel Aviv, uh, Rothschild Boulevard, which is in the middle of the white uh, Bauhaus city. Now, what's happening now um, is that they are building buildings over those Bauhaus buildings because they cannot destroy them. So what we have is really very, very tall atriums and ceilings and they need to fill them. So um, I was lucky enough uh, for people not to believe in me and to be uh, uh, to insist enough uh, to be able to make those lights which are also sustainable, made from LED and um, uh, I made it in Israel by an, uh, Israeli factories, which was also the first time I worked with Israeli factories. I've been working uh, with the acrylic glass um, as it's a very dynamic material. When it's dark, it gets transparent. With light, it reflects light and color. As part of my continuous research, I've developed different objects. On, on your right, it's A, B, C, D, set of tables. One is made from the acrylic glass, the other one from quartz. And on the left, um, blinds. Both have strong expression of reflection and reflection. Um, <coughs> Designers in the Middle project, this is the last one. Um, I started it when I moved to uh, Israel 11 years ago, and I was writing for a local design and architecture magazine. The editor asked me uh, to write about Israeli design, and I was more interested being, I lived in Milan and in London for many years, and I couldn't really quite understand why should we concentrate on Israeli design, which is still young, and I was curious to write about regional design focusing in neighboring countries like Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Syria, which, is for, which has uh, so many cultural and traditional similarities. Obviously, with all my ambition and naivety, uh, this article was never published at the time, um, although I worked on it for six months. And um, the timing is everything, I guess, and three years later, uh, sorry, three years ago, um, slightly after different international exhibitions such as Middle East Reveal and Design Days Dubai, curated by Susan Trocomer, which is here, I think. Hi. <laughs> uh, we presented designers in the middle as a discussion panel during LDF as part of uh, the Design Museum talks, later on at ICFF and Global Design Forum at the BNA. Susan uh, was uh, believing in this project and was mentoring uh, the panel. And our guests came from Lebanon, Israel, Dubai, and Iran. And that's it. Thank you all. Um, so, thanks again. Um, I mean, I don't know if, because my background is an architect, but I kind of see you almost like a, you know, the issue of collaboration comes up in every one of your fields, and we have like different scales almost. We have like products, we have buildings, and you know, the world. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you all kind of experience things in a slightly different way, but I guess I, I was wondering if it might be possible to sort of distill a little bit and sort of try and work out what are the ingredients of a good collaboration. Because in a way, I'm sure you all kind of experience it in a different way, but I have a feeling there is a lot of common ground there. Um, so who, who would like to start? I mean, I'm sure that the basis is respect and trust. And without that, we don't get anywhere. And so it's how do you, um, in any situation, start talking to the other protagonists and, and, and developing that rapport. And um, you know, as an engineer, I don't think you, you learn to collaborate until you understand what everyone else is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that so, so that respect comes from trying to understand what the others are trying to do. And then, uh, uh, and then you try things, and then if it works, then gradually trust builds. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. <laughs> what, what do you guys think? I think curiosity is the key uh, to be able to collaborate uh, because when you're curious as well, you're not judging anyone. Mm -hmm. You just you actually open up yourself and you're um, and you just like expand. Yeah, that makes sense. <coughs> right. I, I'm sure trust and curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> and, and pa I mean, you have to be passionate about yes. the world and 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 passionate about 
trying to find and solve the challenges at hand. So, um, sort of a desire yeah. for a solution as exactly. well to whatever the problem is. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I mean, I guess in a way I kind of see that there are almost like two kinds of collaboration. You have the sort of more normal everyday expected ones where say, you know, if an architect works with an engineer on a project or the manufacturer will create, you know, sort of a, um, a piece that you make. But then you also have the ones that are really building bridges. Um, maybe it's a completely unexpected collaboration. Maybe it's about sort of resolving coffee and be bringing people to the table who would not be there together. And it's still sort of collaboration, but like different levels and different, um, yeah, levels of difficulty, I guess. Um, how important do you think it is for collaboration to like push you outside your comfort zone? Maybe, sure. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think when you're collaborating, you're always pushing mm -hmm. um, yourself outside the comfort zone. You know what you know, you're, you're, you're trying to compromise. You have certain things, um, certain parameters that you'd like to work with. But ultimately, it's about you know bringing different interests um, and understanding the other side. And, and there's a personality component to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it, it's important to be open. It's important to listen. Um, uh, you, you have to come in with a very open mind. Yeah, that's always important. Would you agree, Rona, do you think it's, there's think always an element of... Yeah, yes, obviously I agree. Um, I think it's also before the collaboration, the co when, when there is a collaboration, the magic already happened. I mm. think the pre-collaboration, mm. um, we should all be uh, sort of diplomats in our area. <laughs> Um, and that's really the key because obviously also in a collaboration we always have to find our way and, and also to push to the right directions but the whole thing as a whole is a big diplomacy. Absolutely, on every level. Would you agree, Jane? Yes, I mean, what you were making me think about is that often you're starting in, in a position where to start with people don't, actually don't want to collaborate. So how do you... Um, take those steps to make them think that it's a good idea that they should collaborate for, for a, a mutual, mutually good outcome. At, at, at least on most of our projects, you know, there, there is a client and there's mm -hmm. a team who want the outcome to, to, to be good. They met that probably the, we're struggling more with, they might have different ways of thinking how they get there, okay. yeah. but at least there's a more clearly designed, defined Objectives. So I'd like to hear a bit more from you about how how do you actually get people starting to want to get somewhere? I didn't think they were. Well, I think, I mean it, it, it's very difficult sometimes. So sometimes in the Syria talks initially, um, uh, sort of in the first couple of years, um, <coughs> they weren't sitting on the same table. Mm -hmm. The opposition and and the government were not. They were in separate rooms in Geneva, mm -hmm. and the envoy, uh, the special envoy, had to kind of shuttle between them. And then that becomes a process mm. um, of just bringing them together uh, on the same room. But so at least someone must have decided it would be good even to be in different rooms. Yeah, but well you start it. somewhere yes. and then yes. you, you have to, yeah. um, you know, move. Uh, but there was, I mean today for example, there were, I was reading um, something in the Times about, um, you know, regional countries, Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, Sudan, collaborating on uh, protecting the corals in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. So there are, you know, oh, so there are positive. So, oh yeah, so you find a, a kind of smaller objective and then rather than saying the countries have to work, be together, yeah. but there's something that, they, that would be a benefit. A benefit to everyone. Because I, 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 cause I, cause I, you know, obviously we've got this massive challenge of climate change and <coughs> I think we really need to get diplomats yeah. involved in, in, in helping us to get um, you know, in the built environment, we need to get all the institutions mm -hmm. and all the clients and all the design teams all to see that there's a common ob objective there. And um, lots of us are sort of running around different directions trying to get conversations going, but actually, I think we need diplomats to help us do it better. Sounds, sounds good to me, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's one challenge about bringing people to the table and then you know, there's another challenge of sort of keeping everything kind of stable as sort of conversation progresses and that I'm sure happens in every level. You could start a collaboration and then, you know, things do change, things do fall apart, but you know, 
um, agendas change, priorities change. Um, I really like the, the point you made um, about like what happens with like failed collaborations and what what do you take away from it? I'm sure we've all experienced on some level, you know, projects that didn't work. Mm. Um, is there something that you feel you learn from each of these? Um, maybe one can. I think we should and we are actually learning from failures and hopes and big hopes mainly and then if they don't happen and they fail we do tend or at least should tend to 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 grab and if we believe in them hmm. and sometimes we we should listen to you know and maybe understand it's not the time or maybe it's not it's very much like patterns. When you have a patent, uh, it takes. It took me, for example, six years to make a patent because no one would really even mm -hmm. believe in it or think it's a good time. And you have to be very patient uh, towards uh, sometimes or even not working collaborations and not working processes. And um, I think time is very important in that frame of. Um, so, absolutely. And are there, are there, are there limits to a collaboration? Like how, when do you know sometimes to, when to stop pushing? Because that is another sort of talent, I think, and it's also something that we often find um, ahead of us. I don't know if anybody would like to address that. Actually, could I just say something more about sure. the 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 the, the, um, the requirement, uh, uh, or what we have learned from good collaborations and bad collaborations. Because I think, uh, I know that all the projects which went the best for me always had a champion, often, often on the client side, but not always. So that there was someone who was prepared to really uh, put themselves in a position where they, they were just going to make things happen. And... Um, I, I was struck recently, I was at a conference, and there was a, an Indian engineer talking about how he's trying to get um, people to be allowed to use um, recycled materials as the aggregates for concrete, and concrete obviously is our big problem at the minute in terms of global warming. And he, he seems to be have, have managed to get um, in many different regions of India it to be permissible for them to use uh, waste materials for, in their aggregates. And so I asked him, how did you manage this? And he said, well, you have to deal with the bureaucrats, the building control. And he would look in each department for someone who would buy into this idea and make them be the champion. And I, th I think maybe that's, I, you know, that's a good lesson for us, that we need to, in every situation, try to identify, maybe it's not just one person, but who are the key people who will run with it? Yeah, maybe they are the diplomats of... of it, it, it could be, or it could be a backroom person yeah. who just says, "Right, I'm, I'm going to buy into this." Yeah, they have the passion. Yeah, for it. Cool. Um, should we go back to my question? Yes, sorry. <laughs> no, but I mean, we can. I have, I have other more questions now coming up from your. <laughs> um, let's let's move on. Actually, um, I. It actually ties into what you said just now, um, and also with the built environment, but could also sort of appeal to kind of wider um, issues. How important is it to bring in people then who may not be the obvious collaborator for something? Because maybe, you know, you're working on a building project and you want a scientist involved, somebody who can, you know, work on sort of that level or, you know, also in your work life, I'm sure maybe, you know, it's not obvious, or always the obvious people, the politicians or, you know, um, can you think of examples, or do, do you feel this is something that we have been doing, or we should be doing more? Um, I mean, in, in, in our case, uh, the world has completely changed. Mm -hmm. um, there are companies that operate like states, almost, mm -hmm. um, and um, I think NGOs are very important as well. Mm -hmm. So our, the conversations that you do have, and especially um, you know, we as governments always work with, um, you know, there are the obvious other diplomats and other countries and other officials um, that you typically work with as your sort of first uh, point of call. 
but um, you naturally collaborate with you know academics, with NGOs, <coughs> with, with with the private sector because they bring in expertise um, that you just don't have. That, I think that makes sense to me, and I think we should be doing more and more of that uh, now in, in in design and architecture as well. Um, and there is definitely, I think, a um, sort of wave and tendency of creating and reaching out and creating more unexpected collaborations. I mean, even interdisciplinary um, collaborations within design didn't happen so much between, you know, like 10, 20 years ago. Um, so are there, are there specific strategies you feel in terms of attracting people's attention or bringing them to the table for something like this? Anyway, maybe you can uh, keep going. No, maybe, uh, sorry, I, I didn't quite understand the question. <coughs> I think um, on, on, on a project by project basis, the, the, the key time to raise this is, is, is at the early startup meetings. And, and hmm. to try, you know, to where, because actually during the course of a project, there are not so many meetings often where the client is there and all the design team. But there's usually there usually is a startup meeting of some time, mm -hmm. um, and maybe we're not um, um, proactive enough at saying what should we get out of that first meeting and how can we set the scene. Uh, any one of us could maybe go to such a meeting with our plan. What about, the outcome could be. It's about sort of setting the agenda yeah, in a way as right as from the beginning and yeah. sort of knowing sort of who you want to bring in, but at the same time you do need to be flexible um, and, and, and sort of knowing also, by coming back to my earlier thought about sort of knowing where to stop and where, where to push. Mm -hmm. um, mm, sorry. Um, I, in my area, uh, at least um, uh, designers in the middle project is a good example of that, I think, uh, because it took me eight years to actually be able to bring it to a table or to people's interest. Um, I think if I would have called it designers in the Middle East, it would never happen. Um, but uh, calling it designers in the middle, I think it also um, gives it gives the opportunity to um, open up and 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 to discuss things without necessarily to put a, to the side. You know, this is. Mm. Uh, the place and that's the complexity because we never discuss about politics and conflicts. No, okay. uh, we actually manage magically uh, with people coming from uh, neighboring countries to Israel which they never sat next to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also believing in it. Um, we manage to discuss beautiful things, design and tradition and uh, crafts and we managed to find a common, uh, com common ground to all of us. Uh, so many similarities. Mm. So I, I think sometimes when you do that and you want to bring something to the table, uh, you need really to uh, sort of take a step back uh, to, to oversee things from a little bit from far, from someone else's perspective. I think this is how design can sort of build bridges and you know, this is where bridges, the kind yeah. of whole pun makes sense, I think. Yeah. Can all help each other. Yeah. Um, and go back to kind of Jane's uh, idea of happiness and how eventually collaboration should and should mm. result in some level of happiness. Mm. Mm. Um, and we're a little bit of time, yes, I'm getting the nod. Um, I was wondering if um, it might be a good time to open up to um, some questions from the audience. Anybody has any? I wanted to add something actually because what there was, um, we're going to open up, for, we only have a few minutes for Q&A, so if you have a question, take advantage of the present and of the moment. Um, but Jane and I were having lunch one time with another friend and we spoke. Um, it left an impression on my mind, this, I don't remember if the analogy came from you or from Graham, but this <laughs> idea of when you were working with Zaha or with some of the other architects, creating this almost suspense, suspended reality and this and you spoke about um, the roundabout and kind of how yes. you have to go in circles to create this. In order to achieve something, you have to imagine that anything is possible or suspend one's um, disbelief. So it was, some, it was some, uh, you could say it was a trick I learned from Peter Rice 
when we went for meetings, uh, it was on Stansted Airport actually, at Foster's, and I had done a lot of calculations on an, an alternative for the roof. It, the roof originally was flat with, with cable trusses below it, and, and then Peter said, well, we could make it domed. And uh, I was really struggling, and we were in this meeting, and I was completely shocked, because he said that the tubes could be 10, um, uh, 10 centimetres diameter, and I knew they couldn't. <laughs> and afterwards I said, you know, why did you do this? And he said, well, you know, I didn't want to stop the conversation, and the roundabout will keep going round, and don't worry, <laughs> you know, it's not going to be that solution anyway. And, uh, and that how I've used this trick is when I've worked on competitions with architects and they want to do something. And if, I, if I'm not sure it's going to work, I'll say, well, we, we can submit this for now, but you've got, I've got witnesses here that we might have to modify this a bit in the future. And that quite often gets us past it. And then when it comes to when we come to develop the final design, all sorts of things will have changed anyway. And something else will come out that will have the, maybe respect the original intention, but work in a slightly different way. So I feel that's we're, at that time we were probably existing in a parallel universe. A bit like the parallel universe I was talking about when we do our analysis of structures and we're putting all these random load cases on. It's not, we're not actually analysing reality. We just know that by and large if we follow that route and that recipe almost, that we then produce buildings that behave fine within the complex parameters that a building does finally exist in. Thank you. That was a bit of a digression, sorry. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. That's why we're here. Uh, oh, wonderful. Shall I pass my oh. feedback? I have a more of a comment and a bit of a question. But um, I guess, Jane, going to your um, note about early engagement a first team meeting mm -hmm. where you set the agenda and the client is involved. Um, I work as a client today, I'm a developer, but I've studied architecture and trained as a urban planner. Um, and I'm curious about, you know, as people's roles as individuals become more um, gray, and say, you know, a, mm -hmm. an architect works in product design as well, and um, maybe an interior design or an architect who works as an interior designer or there are these sort of you know, multiple hats that people wear. Do you mm -hmm. find that because of that there's greater kind of mutual understanding and desire to collaborate and really work with each other because things are not so divided mm -hmm. and um, so um, no, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the greyer, the better, in a way. If, 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 we, we, if we all have a little bit of knowledge, I mean, we're not all going to be experts in everything, but if we've got a bit of knowledge about what someone else is trying to do, we can be a bit more sympathetic and more likely come up with solutions that, that can fit into what they're trying to achieve. So, I, I think that, that is good. I, I think that happens to everyone during the course of their career, that they will automatically be learning stuff about what everyone else is doing anyway. Um, so, but, we, but it should be encouraged. We, shouldn't, we should never say to the, the, the younger practitioners, just stay at what you're expert at. You know, be, be, be bold and ask people questions about what they're doing, why they're doing it. So when I'm teaching architects, I'm always saying to them, I want you to ask questions of the engineers, just like I'm asking questions of you. Because unless, uh, uh, unless you engage with them and get, let them into your world, they're always going to just say, oh, well, here's a beam arrangement, take it or leave it. Right. Yeah, and I think it's, it's that kind of digging deeper um, to, to know where someone's coming from, yeah. what they might have to bring to the table or yeah. have to offer that yeah. you wouldn't know if you just yeah. asked for it drawing on something. And probably everyone has other interests and hobbies that have nothing to do with their career, which is all, and it's all relevant. Yeah. Yeah. It all has to come back to trust and respect, which you can gain through understanding and knowing more of um, each side. Anyway, any more? Okay. So